It's no secret that religion has been very patriarchal and has not done women any favors and in fact has really diminished the value of women in uh, so many different ways. It's built into the theology, right? Like Eve is to blame for the fall of humankind. I'm looking for something beautiful. I'm looking for Whitman or Emerson or Blake. I'm looking for Audre Lorde or Claudia Rankine. I'm looking for Simone de Beauvoir. I'm looking for something beautiful, something in profound and timeless words from someone else to share with you as we open the show. And of course, there are beautiful things from all of those poets. At the very end of this show, you'll hear a piece by Walt Whitman. Yes, because he's Walt Whitman, and he is a transcendent, multidimensional, time-space-crossing elven messenger of some sort. I, I don't know. He's, he's all the things. But right now, I want to be in the poetry of my own moment and encourage you also to find the poetry in your own moment for right now the sun is coming down on another day, a random Monday in Northern California, and the tiny cones from the redwoods are dropping onto the glass above me and making little rolling sounds like a tiny little drum being played, a drum of chance, no actual rhythm behind it. I am tired, I'm happy. I had a very, very full weekend I flew from the farm. I had a day with my son preparing his home for the return of his wife. I had a day at a trade show with Gabriela Espinoza, who was just on the show, and with my friend Layla. I had an evening with friends at the Hollywood Bowl, sitting up in a box seat and listening to Maxwell belt out 27 years of R&B, accompanied by incredible, gorgeous light and rhythm and everybody standing up in their seats and cheering and living this one human experience together. And at one point, he turned from the stage to the audience and held his microphone out and the entirety of the Hollywood Bowl sang the lyrics back at him. And he started to cry. And then the next day, I spent the morning talking with my business partner and went for a float and went to sing with friends and a dinner party, and then I got in my car and drove until four o'clock in the morning and landed in my very own bed so that I could hear the cones of the redwoods falling on the glass and be here in my own body appreciating that poem that is my life. And you could probably do the same, narrate the beauty of your own experience and become inwardly referential. Today we are talking with Jim Palmer and one of the core messages he has as a former ginormous church uh, evangelist, evangelical Christian pastor who has come into a belief system that celebrates everything, every day and everybody that doesn't believe in the theology of separation, that doesn't believe in the theology of original sin, but rather in the celebration of being in these bodies as we are born, and who works with people who are finding themselves again, learning to trust themselves again as they come out of toxic religion. He also works with other pastors and preachers and chaplains who are finding themselves similarly disillusioned with the narratives that cause so much suffering and the habits of spiritual bypass masquerading as grace. Jim has so many wonderful books. His most recent one is called Inner Anarchy, but so many great books, great blog posts, wonderful things to say. And I hope you enjoy this conversation on what it would mean to decolonize the more poisonous thoughts of Christianity and replace them with the true teachings of Jesus, which are not about organization building, but about the divine spark uh, that lives inside each of us. And if you are indeed coming out of a toxic religious environment, how you might find some support. 
I'm Christine Marie Mason. This is the Rose Woman Podcast on Love and Liberation. And please welcome Jim Palmer. You know, I remember um, my, my family was living in Chicago way back in the 80s and 90s. And I think my mother went to Willow Creek. Mm, okay. And so I remember her finding it, and she was so turned on by this, what she felt was a, a fresh view, sort of a step away from her upbringing in the Catholic Church, which had turned her off. And she'd, all, she'd have this longing to find, uh, to find spirituality and this sort of what she perceived at the time as like liberal, dynamic, music, friendly people uh, seemed to invite a new way. And then she became disillusioned with that also. And I have the sense that it was for some of the same reasons that you've talked about, sort of a hypocrisy and a separation. And I wonder if you might tell us a little bit about your journey. Um, did you did you grow up feeling the pull of the sacred from the time you were young? How did you, you went to seminary? How did you find your way up to the top of this sort of a, evangelical movement and then make the decision to shift. I grew up in a very volatile family. You know, my mother was an alcoholic. She suffered from mental illness. My father left our family when I was very young. I had an older brother who's very violent individual. And so my youth and my childhood and youth was very volatile. And I was sort of a aimless, you know, who am I? What's life about and so on? Well, my senior year in high school, I became friends with a guy who had just moved into town. He was a kicker on our football team. And one day at a McDonald's in Blacksburg, Virginia, he convinced me that God could turn my life around and give me a purpose for a living and was sort of the answer going forward after a very uh, difficult uh, childhood and youth of suffering. So I sat in that McDonald's and, you know, over my Coke and hash browns and accepted Jesus as my savior. And then off I went to college. I was going to play football in college, but I had a severe injury that prevented me from playing. But I went anyway. And then my freshman, well, the first week of school, I ran into the campus director of Campus Crusade for Christ, which is a parachurch ministry. We I became friends with him um, in the student center, and he invited me to the Campus Crusade for Christ ministry. And it was there, I kind of started to form a sense of identity as a person because I learned that I could do a couple things well. I could talk and I had some basic leadership gifts. So I became the student body president of our Campus Crusade for Christ uh, ministry. And uh, at that time, I, I discovered a gentleman who was coming into the, the, the college town to start a church. And I discovered him became part of that kind of church growth or that church planting venture. He's the one who impacted me to think about going into full-time ministry. So I take off to Chicago to become a pastor, studied at Trinity Divinity School. And while I was there, someone said, Jim, you really should consider ministry at Willow Creek because, you know, my professors felt like I could fit really well in a context like that and so on. So I went to Willow Creek and drove past it about three times because I couldn't believe a church could be like a whole entire like campus that looked like a college. But went to Willow Creek, met Bill Hybels, Don Cousins, others of the church leaders, and they invited me to come on staff. And I did that and cut my teeth on ministry, if you will, at Willow Creek Community Church. And at the time, they were sending people across the country to launch other churches similar to that. And I came to Nashville and I did that. So, um, you know, as a part of Willow Creek, you start to build a name for yourself. People start to recognize who you are. You start speaking at church growth conferences. You go out and start your own church and you kind of become that sort of rock star, pastor, public figure kind of person. But then one day, senior pastor of this church I realized something dawned on me and, and what dawned on me was that a lot of the problems in people's lives were persisting, even given my foolproof, seminary approved, you know, 
uh, theology about God. And I started noticing that there was still anxiety, depression, broken relationships, chronic unhappiness. And I kind of stepped back and also looked in the mirror and realized that even myself, that there was a lack of peace in my own life that then caused me to realize there's something like really wrong here. There's something wrong with the fact that I roll in every Sunday to a sea of faces listening to me, you know, share what I believe to be very good and, you know, information about God and so on, very contemporary environment, but the deep change in people's lives didn't seem to be happening. So I left. While you're going through all of this training, at any point, did they bring you back to the trauma you'd experienced as a child, the alcoholism and all that stuff? Did any of that work happen, the, the sort of psychological work or the trauma healing? No, it didn't, Christine, because one of the themes in at least the kind of evangelical Christianity that I was involved in is this idea that the old is gone and the new has come. So basically that can be a sort of permission to not really face and address pain, heartache, abuse, and other things in your past, right? Because the idea is that once you accept Jesus, like there's a there's a transformation and the old life is gone, right? Even in baptism, they say, you know, you laid in the water, you come out, you're the new person, you're the transformed person and so on. And so on top of that, a lot of traditional religion, and, and look, I don't, you know, I don't speak on behalf of all religion. I know that people's experience of religion is different. I don't pretend that mine is representative of all religion, but in the uh, the evangelical Christian circles that I was part of, it, it, there was a sort of inadequate understanding of mental health and mental health services to address trauma and abuse in people's lives. You know, like. It's, you can't like Bible verse and pray and obey yourself out of everything. <laughs> you know, like there is there is a reason why there is a whole field of mental health that deals with a spectrum of mental health challenges from depression to bipolar to abuse, anxiety and so on. Yeah, that seems to me that one of the critical things is like we've, uh, we go through all of these experiences and we're feeling bad. And we create these adaptations that help us feel a little bit better in the moment. But to unwind those, that's not happening because I put my head in the baptismal font, you know. So I have to re—I have to get my head right in a lot of ways. Like it's a whole arsenal of embodiment practices in addition to a sense of the sacred that might provide an avenue forward. So, okay, so let me go back to your – so you're at this point. You're at this choice point. Please continue your story. I interrupted you. Okay, so – I have a sort of a crisis in terms of, for the first time, seeing that my perfect seminary developed evangelical theology didn't seem to be transforming people at a deep level. And it was also true of me. So that was sort of like the beginning of the end in terms of realizing that I needed to figure out like what happened, where did I go wrong? What, what like this isn't right and I need to figure out what that is. So I resigned as a pastor of the church, which was basically giving up my ministerial career, giving up my identity because it was all revolved around being a pastor, being a Christian, giving up my church family and my social network, kind of throwing myself in a bit of an existential crisis because I realized that some of my theology, I began noticing ways that it didn't really add up. So I left all of that and completely immersed myself in just every day that lived human experience away from Christian subculture and be, and, and started over. And some of that starting over in my first book, Divine Nobodies, I share a lot of the initial stories of me just crossing paths with people, these unsuspecting people who taught me things about God, about spirituality, about life, about myself, which are not the kinds of people that you would expect to learn them from, like the waitress at Waffle House, like Rick, Rick the Tire Salesman, like you know, a hip hop artist and a girl with 
was severely uh, disabled, just a whole host of people kind of began to come into my life that really challenged my view of myself, God, the world. Like my theology worked great in Christian subculture. And part of that subculture was that, you know, was appearances, right? Like you, you come into the church and you kind of put on that air that I'm okay, I'm fine. You know, my biggest problem is I don't, I don't know. I didn't spend, I haven't memorized enough Bible verses today. And it kind of can like, there's a meeting based relational thing that happens in organized church that sometimes lacks the authenticity and the vulnerability that would really encourage deep life change. And I began to experience that just, you know, with people in, in everyday walks of life. And then after I wrote my first book, Divine Nobodies, then to see if people started contacting me, Jim, I totally, you know, like I'm in church, I'm a Christian, I feel the same things you do. I feel like this is not working for me. I'm starting to question some of my beliefs. What do I do? I got emails from pastors, Jim. I'm a pastor of a church. I'm not sure if I even believe what I'm teaching anymore. I feel empty and burned out. What do I do? And so that was all the way back in 2005. Yeah, this I, this moment that you had before you wrote the book and when you decided to leave, I'm very curious about the humility in that and the willingness to step away from effectively the prize that you've been working toward and how rare it is, Jim, that somebody will listen to that little voice and go, nah, -uh. nope, I got to step away and give it all up. And I just wonder how you got through that. It was difficult because there were other possibilities that I could have taken. Like I was encouraged like to go on a sabbatical, you know, Jim, just go away for a while you know, and then come back. But I realized that my level of questioning my Christian beliefs and my kind of collapse of confidence in the transformation of people through my teaching and the biblical theology that I was, was, was using, it, it didn't warrant just taking a break and coming back. Like, because, you know, what happens sometimes with churches is like you can split churches and people, you know, all this kind of stuff can happen if a person leaves a church. And I don't want to have anything to do with that at all. So I just kind of was like, I need to not be here. And I don't want the pressure of trying to figure something out so I can come back in like a month or two months or three months. And it was difficult because... I had no idea who I really was as a person when I went off to college. And one thing that religion did for me is it did give me a, a sense of identity as a person. It's where I discovered what I was skilled at. It gave me beliefs that make, made me feel a sense of certainty about what was right and wrong in life and what my purpose was and what was going to happen to me when I died. And of course, you know, I received praise and affirmation and attention and, you, you know, and it feels good, you know, to be someone that others hold in regard and high regard. So leaving all of that was lonely, fearful. Since then, so many people who contact me to tell me their story about leaving religion, it's very similar. They leave all these things behind just, and there's just deep loneliness and feelings of betrayal and it, it's a volatile experience. And so it, it was the, the best thing. I, I knew that I needed to do that and I knew that I couldn't continue on. It, it's not that different from, I, you know, my first two books I wrote, uh, so I signed a book deal to write my first two books. That was Divine Nobody's in Wide Open Spaces. And then I signed another two book deal and the first one of, of that was called Being Jesus in Nashville. And the whole appeal of the book was that I was trying to figure out if and how Jesus might be important now that I sort of like let most of the theological foundation that I had Jesus on let that go. And everyone was super excited about me writing this book because it was kind of like it would write itself, you know, like no one knows exactly chapter to chapter what was going to happen. Well, 
I think everybody assumed that what was going to happen, because my premise in writing the book was this idea that there's no real difference between me and Jesus and anything Jesus did I could do because there's no, there's no way that Jesus is divine and human in some kind of way that I'm not. So that was my premise going into it. And of course, everyone thought, well, of course, Jim's going to learn this isn't true. Of course, he's going to figure out Jesus is different and it's going to be funny to see when he discovers this, but that's not what happened. Yeah. I felt like I felt when I was reading your thing is like the new story of Jesus is actually the old story of Jesus. You know, like you're going back to the roots on like, what would it just mean to live this way in love and care and listening to people and being present and sharing and all that stuff. But I might be projecting. Go ahead. Well, yeah, well, and I only mentioned it because then what happened was my publisher came and said, Jim, you're really stretching beyond the bounds of orthodox Christian theology and could easily be you know, labeled as a heretic because you have written these things and we're going to give you one chance to essentially edit your manuscript in these ways where we feel like you're touching on things that people are going to have a problem with. And, you know, I couldn't do it. So they canceled my book contract. Um, They'd never published the book and they canceled the whole two book contract. So that was another watershed. And then after that, Lifeway Christian Resources, they pulled all my books out of their stores. All Christian bookstores started pulling all of my books because Divine Nobodies was sort of tolerable to most people. You know, it was just, it was relatively harmless, really. I mean, I do kind of point out the hypocrisy that I experienced as a Christian and in my church involvement, but that one was acceptable and wide open spaces was sort of pushing the envelope but after being jesus it was kind of like that was the the end but you you since self-published those they're available on amazon yes i i I sent self-published and written you know a few books after that but there's another you know just to say there's a couple times when i've had to walk away from some security to follow the path that's right i mean i feel like you're there's something in what you're saying that is this sort of divine spark of knowing who you are, that if you don't follow that, then you become a shell of your true self. And to have the courage to follow that, even at great cost, personal cost in the short term, has certainly, it seems from the outside anyway, over the last decade, uh, born fruit. Like you were touching something deeply true that resonated with a lot of other people. And it seems just looking at like what's happening online is the more people who are reading your books, getting the message, being in violent agreement with the things you're saying, that the backlash uh, uh, toward you from organized religion seems to be getting stronger. That the more truth you're talking, it's getting bigger. Yeah, I think what here one thing that I discovered along the way is that when I really tap into my innermost or deepest feelings, and I I sometimes like this throws Christian people off because, right, we all heard feelings are bad and dangerous. And, you know, the Bible verse that says a heart is deceitful, which is a mistaught Bible verse and so on. In other words, maybe another way to say it is when I reach deep into the interior of myself, And I bring that out naturally in my own words and thoughts that that connects with people as opposed to trying to be the enlightened, brilliant, sophisticated. But I think that's really where the power is, is in the in that deeply rooted authenticity and vulnerability. Well, I guess what I mean by vulnerability is that we all we can borrow words and concepts and teachings and ideas and we can kind of parrot them and there's even good reason to you know share things that we learn from other people the wisdom of others and so on but there's no substitute for dipping down into the well of your own interior self and speaking that in the most natural words that you have to communicate it. Like, I just think that that connects with people. So, but you're right. I mean, I do have, every day I get messages from people that are calling down the wrath of God on my head, telling me that I'm the next Jim Jones, that, you know, I'm Satan and I'm deceiving and leading people astray. And so, you know, like that happens. Um, It's just, I guess, kind of part of it. 
you're reminding me of that, what's that Emerson quote? To believe your own thought, to believe what is true for you in your private heart is true for all men. That is genius. Speak your latent conviction and it shall be the universal sense for the inmost in due time becomes the outmost. And I mean, it's, it's so like right on point with that. But a lot of people, we just did a, an interview with a woman named Saga Briggs who wrote a book on interoception. And, and this idea that, that the feeling and perceiving of the signals that are coming from your body, like you write about trusting what you most deeply feel, but like what that many people have lost touch with and lost the trust in anything that their body is telling them, whether it's uh, the pain they're feeling, their emotional signals, they're hot or cold, they're hungry, their sexual urges, like the body has become an untrustworthy ally. And so even getting to what you think you desire you want seems to be a stretch. Yeah, I mean, I do think for sure, especially in religion, there tends to be a sort of diminishment of the body in favor of what's referred to as the spirit. And people who are going through deconstruction, a lot of people, they leave their belief system and they think what they kind of need to do is find better beliefs to replace the old ones that don't make sense anymore. And although that's part of it, the reconstruction work, the foundation is building a new relationship with yourself. Because in religion, people become codependent even to God. And what I mean by that is like codependent to God, meaning that whatever God wants as taught by my church leaders through their interpretation of the Bible, like it's, it's what God wants. It, you know, I should be thinking what God wants me to think. I should be wanting what God wants me to want. I should be moving towards something I think God wants. And like, it is a codependence. We could do a whole podcast only talking about how religion, certain the toxic religion anyway, fosters this codependence, which sabotages almost every aspect of a person's relationship with themselves. So self-awareness, self-love, self-acceptance, self-compassion, self-respect, self-expression. I mean, like it goes all the way down the list. Um, today, I had a call with an ex-Mormon and, it, you know, people who leave Mormonism, it's it's particularly the case that there's so much behavior control and mind control that you really lose touch with an autonomous, independent self. And it's not easy to get back. That's right. Or like Jehovah's Witnesses, they even they do even shunning. And then you're just left alone out there after having your entire world constructed from this community. Very difficult to do. So how do you, I love the word reconstruction, and it's not one that is really familiar to me. So let's, let's say you do decide, like you've come to the point where you're in a tradition and it's just become too much for you to hold the hypocrisy or the sense of not believing it. And you know there's something. And you step away. What are the phases people go through in reconstruction? So a lot of people will contact me who left their religion. And right away, you know, they, they have all these, uh, the consequences that they feel, their existential crisis, their betrayal, hurt anger, disappointment, confusion, lack of sense of identity, and so on. You know, all those feelings are normal and they, it, you know, no one can tell a person like how long they should feel those things. But one thing I realized is that people can get stuck in an anti-religion fervor. All those feelings that I just shared are part of it, but there's more than just being, you know, like angry at religion and its abuses. Although there are many people who see their calling to point out exposed toxic religion, and I totally get that uh, doing that. But so the deconstruction part is taking, breaking down the little pieces. What happened? How did you get here? These beliefs, where did they come from? Do they pass the mustard of your deep inner knowing or even critical thinking and so on? And honestly, that's sort of the easiest part of it. It's the part that people are most worried about, but you can kind of easily discover the absurdities and a lot of religious beliefs and move off of them if conceptually, but they're so deeply embedded in a person. You know, like just let's take the doctrine of original sin, which says that you are inherently born a bad person at the core. And that's not an easy shame-based message about yourself that 
you know, you can just get over. So I think the first part of the, the process is an acknowledgement, a validation of what a person's going through and all the volatility of it. And then it is starting to lay that foundation of a different kind of relationship with yourself. And sometimes I'll work with the person with very simple questions that are not easy to answer, but the, you know, what brings you joy? What centers you within yourself? What form of self-expression is meaningful? Where do you find life meaningful? Where do you feel at home in your body? And just start to explore a lot of different kinds of questions to get to some answers that they're, that, that they're kind of generating from the inside out. You know, now you do have to go back and look at the hurts and abuses and the toxic doctrine and sort of disentangled that part of it. And depending on whether you were in a cult where you were severely brainwashed or even experienced other forms of abuse, in many cases, even sexual abuse, then that's something that needs also to be addressed. So I think that my work as a spiritual director with people is it, it, there's really not like a cookie cutter formula to it, but there are some things I've learned from doing this for 20 years in terms of like what the kinds of things people will have to do in terms of the deep personal work to be liberated from the harms that religion did to them. Yeah, I mean, what I, one of the things I like about the way that you, everybody, Jim does a lot of lists. He does, here's 15 things, here's 10 things, you know, and he'll, he's got the benefit of looking across many people who have left and seeing some patterns and then looking at some of these underlying theological doctrines like original sin or, you know, you have to get, you earn your way to God versus you're born perfect and you're naturally already an expression of divine energy just by being born. You're incarnated literally as a spark of light, like the, that, that you are able to point out some of the more common perversions of thought that people go, oh yeah, I do have that versus it being kind of in the water of their, their breathing. So it, it's so in ourselves sometimes we don't even notice. Yes, I think one thing you really hit on there is that theist, Christian theism as a framework for understanding God can be very problematic because it starts with the idea that there is a sky God out there somewhere and I'm separate from that God. And I even, not only separate from that God, but I could be the object of that God's wrath and punishment, and I could be sentenced to eternal conscious torment of being separated from God in hell. So sometimes Christian theism, to me, starts with a deeply flawed idea of God in separation. And it doesn't stop there. If you're separated from God, you're separated from love, separated from peace, liberation, guidance, wisdom. You know, you're separated from it all because God is the one who has it. You got to figure out a way to get it versus what you said, Christine, which is that, and I think this is the whole point of Jesus when he was saying that he was divine and human or that idea of the story and the legend of Jesus and that claim is that ultimate reality, that ground of being, that uh, the nature or essence of all things is we are a manifestation, an expression of that complete, infinite, timeless, whole, like whatever word you want to put on it, whether it's religious language like God or Eastern spirituality language or even the language of physics or philosophy, you know, that, that, that we are bringing into the universe our lived human experience that divine essence is taking shape within our lived human experience and as human beings. You're sounding like a tantric. Yeah. Well, all of Christianity, Orthodox Christianity, falls on the idea that we're separated from God. Therefore, Jesus had to die. He had to be sacrificed. The blood sacrifice of Jesus was designed to solve this problem of separation. And in my view, the number one message of Jesus, which I think is really hard to miss, is that there is no separation. There isn't any. That's it. So and people will say, people will say, well, Jim, what are you, are you saying that I'm, are you saying that you're God? Well, 
you know, if you run down the ocean with a Dixie cup and you scoop up some water, someone could ask, well, is the ocean in that cup? And the answer is both no and yes. It's no, only because the whole ocean is not going to fit in the Dixie cup, right? Like that's, right. however, the, the full properties of the ocean is present in the Dixie cup. So there's a way that the answer is yes, the whole ocean is in that cup. And so you and I are expressions of the properties of the ultimate reality that we use the word God to sort of talk about, or at least some people do. So it's going all the way back to that point that you're really not separated from love, peace, transformation, liberation, wisdom, and all of that. It's actually woven into the fabric of what you are most fundamentally. I, l I love what you're saying foundationally. And when I said it's very tantric, it's, you know, that's where I ended up with um, in my own personal looking like what makes sense. It's like you're split into an individual soul, but your job is to fully experience your life in this body and reflect it back to the whole as an honoring of what's possible in the human body, not like a denial, you know, and, and the whole Dixie cup idea completely fits with that. Even if you, even if you become humanist or a more open, uh, let's call it restorative Christian, like restoring that original idea of divine light and lack of intercession into your theology. You're still, we're still living in a culture that is run by people who have inherited and internalized a lot of those beliefs. Like we're, we're still a very Calvinist, earn your way kind of culture. And as a woman in this culture, and I want to switch to some of your writing on that for a moment. Oh, by the way, very thorough response to the Barbie movie. I want, you know, that as a woman in this culture, a lot of the rules are made by people who don't seem to like women very much. And I wonder if you might speak a little to, to that. Like, how does religion in the West, in America in particular, um, still live in the women that you work with or in the people in your practice? Well, the first thing I would say is I love Barbie. I have a daughter, you know, she's finishing up her master's in social work and her and her boyfriend went to see it. She's like, dad, you got to go see Barbie. Okay. So I did, I went and I real I love the movie for so many different reasons. And it really like helped me understand so many different things that after all, Barbie is a doll that was created and even the body parts of the doll are the way they are fundamentally because it made the doll easier to play with and move around. It's not like the the doll creator said, hey, why don't we create a doll with a Barbie who's got really long slender legs so we can shame women into not looking like her, not looking like that Barbie. So I really love the idea of in that movie becoming a uh, human in the totality of what that means, you, you know, with your flaws and uh, imperfections, you being able to decide what it means for you to be a woman uh, coming out from under all the expectations and definitions of it. And so there, it's no secret that religion is has been very patriarchal and has not done women uh, any favors and in fact has really diminished the value of women in uh, so many different ways. It's built into the theology, right? Like Eve is to blame for the fall of humankind. Uh, so we start right there at the beginning that there's sort of this diminishing idea about women. Um, and then it kind of goes off the rails culturally with uh, patriarchal culture. Then we'll take it and come up with all these silly different ideas about, you know, women can't be ministers or they can't be leaders or they're temptresses to men and so on, which is, you know, just um, it has no real basis in reality. Simone de Beauvoir, she is a one of the most underappreciated philosophers in Western civilization. And she is underappreciated mainly because she happened to be the lover of Sartre. And so he um, gets more credit than she does. But Simone wrote a book called The Second Sex. And it was really the foundational book for second wave feminism, where she the reason why she titled the book Second Sex 
is that the idea is that women have always been defined by men. Like there's men and then like there's the knockoff sort of, which is the woman and men get to decide, they get to define what it means to be a woman. And one of the things that Simone says in this book is that like one is not born a woman, meaning that we're all born into a narrative and an ideology about what we're supposed to be. And one is not born a woman, she said, because one wills themselves forward into life. And for the woman and the man kind of, uh, you know, forges into reality what that means. But because women have been so shrouded in the definitions and expectations and ideas of men, they've they've not in large part really been able to do that. So I, I can't tell you how many letters I get from women who tell me that they learned in church, that that they, they God valued them less than men. You know, uh, women are often, unfortunately, purity culture uh, afflicts women much more than men. Uh, the responsibility of sexuality is, is placed squarely on women. So it's there's just so many ways between purity culture, between patriarchal dominance, a really bad theology that somehow pins the fall of you know Homo sapiens on a woman. Like all of this is not good for a woman's thinking about you know who and what she is in the world. Yeah, we're seeing a really big rebirth in the goddess traditions, and even in the Magdalene is totally getting rehonored. But I want to read. Here, I want to read a part from your writing. This is from the Barbie writing. It says, my religious conditioning programmed me with an untrue, flawed, inadequate, and harmful view of women. And then you list them. So ladies, if you're listening, or men who love women, like these are some of the beliefs that are promulgated in some churches, not in all. A women brought sin and death into the world. Women are to blame for the fall of the human race. Women are inferior to men physically, mentally, and spiritually. And aside, just try having a baby. Women were intended to be subservient to men. Women are not capable of exercising authority and leadership. A godly woman is silent, submissive, and domestic woman. Women are responsible for the sexual temptations and transgressions of men. Women are weak, emotional, and irrational. Women are expected by God to stay in demeaning, damaging, destructive, or abusive relationships. Women should deny and repress themselves in order to serve and satisfy others. And women who are act assertively and defiantly enforce personal boundaries or express anger are un godly so that is quite a list so if any of those things resonate you know maybe you question them yeah and it's a short list i mean it's longer than that but those are like you know the highlights yeah at least on that list like in other words there's a way that patriarchal religion shames a human being for being a woman in judaism one of the first prayers of the day is thank you god for not making me a woman in the opening prayer of their morning prayers. Right. There's all kinds of ways that Western religion has, you might say, cursed by a, a unilateral male-dominated organization. And it's it's really unfortunate. And hopefully, like you're saying, as more people, there's a something there's something called process philosophy or process theology, process thinking, which is the idea that that God, our understanding of God you know, the, it naturally is going to evolve and it should to the extent that it's evolving by affirming and validating and fully calling into the universe, the presence and the being of women, you know, is obviously a, a, a monumental step forward. That's right. And so to replace that, this is the theology. I'm going to also post you guys this uh, 10 ways toxic religion messes up sexuality blog i'll cross link that because in the stuff that we've been talking about these are the places where a lot of our listeners get caught up in enjoying their body so i want them to read this but because we have so much more i still want to cover i want to go to this idea of your all life is sacred each human being belongs and every moment matters what you call everything ology every one ology and every day ology and how did you you know tell me a little bit about this immersive and very loving philosophy how did that emerge and how does that show up for you well eventually i realized religion is really good at separating people 
compartmentalizing spirituality, creating us and them, the us being the subculture and everyone else is the them that's outside of it. But I started realizing that from almost every feasible way of looking at it, that oneness is the secret and the basis of everything and connects everybody together. Like, for example, let's even take Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Maslow came up basically with a theory where he he basically says every single human being wants and fears the same things. Now, it might look different in terms of how that plays out, but we all, and, and he created this hierarchy, right? Like at the very bottom, we all want to survive, meet our needs for water, food, shelter, safety. And as you go up that that triangle or that hierarchy then moves into emotional needs, the need for love, affirmation, relationship, intimacy. And then at the top, he had self-actualization, which is to, to, you know, the, the fullest actualization of the potentialities and possibilities at your disposal as, as a human being. And then later in life, yeah, he actually added another at the top, which was about self-transcendence. But the point is, I can go to every human being in this world and on just purely on the basis of Maslow's model, I can understand how I am more like that person than I am different. The, the other thing that you can do is that you can deconstruct all human behavior and it, you end up going back to a very similar set of things that explains why people even do some of the most horrible things. Like I read a book called Listening to Killers. It was a book written by a man who spent a 35 year career being an expert witness in trial cases involving serial killers. So basically he spent hundreds and hundreds of hours interviewing serial killers in order to be an expert witness about, you know, their their sanity, their mental uh, state, and so on. He wrote a book about it, and I was shocked at the commonalities between people who commit heinous crimes like serial killing, the abuse in the past, the violence in the past. So then I realized, hey, you know, if you did nothing more than just go from the pure homo sapiens, human species, like, you can find all kinds of ways where you realize that other people are, you share something in common with them. So if you hold the belief that there's only one thing and everything else is an expression of that one thing, you know, like if, if, if I look into your eyes and I, if I could look into your eyes and look deeply enough What I would discover is that you are the same thing that I am. And even our bodies, to some extent, are masking this basic truth, which is on an energetic level, on a spiritual level, on an ultimate reality level, that there is a way that we are actually one with each other. And even though we get to have this experience, the lived human experience in our bodies that are real, we we embody that divine essence. There is a deeper truth than that that makes you and I the same one thing. So it's silly to talk about anything like uh, one of the criticisms is people will say if you leave religion is, oh, well, you're just a universalist now. And I tell people all the time, you're right. I'm a universalist. I believe all people universally have worth. I believe universally that all people fear and want the same things. I believe all people universally are grounded in the same. There's one ground of being, which is what we fundamentally are. So, yes, I am a universalist. Um, And that really became a basis of compassion. In other words, like I realized that compassion isn't just a transactional thing that you either offer or you don't based on some judgment of the person, if they deserve it, you know, whatever. Rather, the universal, objectless, non-transactional compassion that I move through the world being compassion. It doesn't matter what or who shows up before me because I'm one with that same thing that's appearing. And I actually realized that this is a very good way forward for people who leave religion. Sometimes people leave religion and they're like, well, I don't know what I believe anymore. I need to figure out what God is now. I'm not sure what's going to happen when I die. I don't have any certainty about anything. 
And I will often tell people the most important things you need to know, you already know. You already know them. For example, no one disputes love. If I ask a person if they believe in love, they say, well, of course I believe in love. Love is good when I give it. It's good when I receive it. We all know the world would be a better place if there was more love. We know the absence of love creates problems. So you could go through the rest of your life and just ask this one question. And this would be enough to give you guidance and a path forward if you never figured out anything else. If you just asked yourself in every moment, what does it mean right now for me to be love? Now, I'm not saying that the answer is always easy, right? Like being love with your best friend versus being love with, you know, your ex spouse who abused you or being love with people you don't like. Like the answer is not always easy, but it can always be the right question. You can always ask that and you can orient yourself to that ground of being. What does it mean right now for me to be love? What does it mean right now for me to be compassion? That's right. Radiate that love, be that love. And that doesn't require a particular dogma. Right. Now I did say that with the next Mormon, well today actually, and she said, yes, it's just so unfortunate that in Mormonism and I guess also in other strains of religion, that love is so bastardized, you know, it makes it conditional. It makes it's like, it's not that it's hard even to, you know, accept the word because it's been so corrupted by religion. Like God, like the word God. Yes. So let's just do it for a minute. Let's, let's look at, let's look at the word love and feel it. Like what's the, okay. Like if I think of the word, maybe everybody else could try it too. What comes up for you? when you think of like be love or love your you love your neighbor as yourself or any or the golden rule like any anything around that what comes up for you do you trust the word love what do you feel and and just and notice that like for me i notice there's a, a overlay of like love in the romantic erotic sense and i know i for sure don't trust that and then there's the the like the layer of love that is the love of my children and my love of pets and the love of the natural world, the green and growing world. And that I feel very light inside. I feel very lit up. And then the sort of like preachy love where it just feels like, wait, that doesn't let me be messy and all of my upset, my hurt, my anger. And I, I only associate that kind of love with being a little bit inauthentic. So even, even just in that short exercise for me, and I'm sure other people have come up with hundreds of other experiences, you can rest, you can like drop into the body and notice where the word's corrupted and can you reclaim it for yourself? Yes, and, and, and you can also go behind the word. Like one thing I realized and I've taught some linguistics, one of the great gifts of post-modernity is this sort of deconstruction of language. So we know that our species created language as this social technology that we could cooperate and propagate ourselves forward. We, the, the word chair, like we can all use this word and we roughly kind of know that we're talking about this thing that supports our weight where we can sit, but it's not like there's a thing called a chair, an objective thing in the universe. It's a word we created. It's a symbol to indicate something. And the more abstract our language comes, the more this kind of breaks down, like the word God, for example. You know, you could mean any number of different things by using that word, although we might agree that it roughly is approximating something at the level of ultimate reality. So take the word love. I've learned for myself that I've got to break it down. Like what, like the word love is such a big word, you know, like, it, like it's one of those means everything. So it doesn't really mean anything, you know, like. What is love exactly? And I think that exercise that you just did is a way of really getting to that where you start thinking about what it means to, you could say uh, that, that love is moving towards another person in a spirit of, of goodness and regard. Say that love is a willingness to see the deepest truths and the best of another person. Love could be not reinforcing the lie by participating in it with people who are coming at you with it. It could mean like an, so many different things. 
You know, like right now for me, love in this instance, even talking with you is holding you with like regard, you know, like I've never, we've not really had conversations before. I've appreciated everything that you say. I know that we are one at the deepest level and that me talking to you in this way is masking the way that we are one with each other. It's carrying within side of me a a wish for your well-being, for the whole expression of who and what you are. It's an appreciation for the person that, you know, Christine has become as a human person with all that's happened, you know, like a real acknowledgement of of who you are as that you know human expression of the ground of being and you're like walking through the world with this lens where you're where you're seeing i i went in for many years i was going into san quentin my mother was the victim of a violent crime she was murdered and when i um started teaching yoga and stuff like that i ended up going into san quentin and um being a stand-in for victims' families with people who'd committed similar crimes. That's what my mother experienced. And that seven years of doing that taught me what you were talking about, that that every single one of those people had a similar story around substances, around violence that was done to them, abuse that was done to them. It was a learned separation. And the journey to healing for every single one was to replace the separation with this lens of love and holding each person in high regard. And that it was possible even for people who'd stepped out that far from the union, which was, and I think that's the, re- that love and redemption story was probably, it was probably the biggest turning point in my life. So I love what, I love that you're saying that. I want, I want to ask you before we wind up this, which is this hour has gone so fast. Um, I, I want to, I want to ask you about humanism. I think there's some confusion on atheism, on humanism, and talk to talk to me a little bit about humanism, about this uh, society you formed, about chaplaincy, spirituality versus religion. Okay, so the distinction generally between atheism and humanism, although I think it's a little unfair to atheism, but the basic idea is that atheism is a position about the non-existence of God. You know, it's a theist, which means I'm not a theist. I do not believe that there is a God as conceived by religion. And like, honestly, I think Jesus would qualify as an atheist from the standpoint of not holding a belief in the God of religion anyway. But atheism would be a position. Now, people will say the humanism is more of a lifestyle. It is a way of life that it defines and describes the path forward without any association with what could be conceived as the supernatural. And so in that sense, it's kindred to atheism or most atheism in that it doesn't really hold space for the idea of the supernatural. And so a humanist would, and atheist, but feels like that the scientific explanation of the universe, the use of critical thinking, direct experience, reason and ration, rational thinking are the, the tools that are both necessary and adequate to move forward in the world to create a civilization that works for everyone. And the reason why all that's a little unfair is that both atheists and humanists can be and are often spiritual people. It's just that they don't think of their spirituality as relating to the the traditional concepts of God and eternity and, you know, other kinds of, of religious themes. And, you know, like if you go back in history, Baruch Spinoza, he was a, a philosopher. He was considered to be an atheist, and yet he spoke about God all the time. And he conceived of God as like the, 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 the one nature of all reality from which everything else comes. And he genuinely felt like that this was God, even though he never felt that God was something to be known on a personal level like you would a human being. 
you know, there's a very wide spectrum between fundamentalist religion and atheism about how you might think about God and spirituality. You'd sort of be missing it if you kind of think that like it's sort of one or the other, like there's a lot of space in there in the middle. Now, what I've been slightly concerned about is that humanism and atheists sometimes steer away from spirituality because they're concerned it's going to bleed over into supernaturalism and that's not what they want. I sort of came up with this term and it's not a perfect term, but you got to come up with something. And what I came up with was non-religious spirituality. It's not anti-religious, but it's non-religious in the sense that it creates a space for people to sort of have an exploratory spirituality that doesn't require it to be hooked up to the, the mindset, the attitudes, the belief systems that are associated with religion. So I think that if, if a, you know, if, when a person says they're atheist, by definition, it's a definitive position about their belief in, in their not being God as God is traditionally conceived. And humanism isn't really wanting to stake a position. They're wanting to create a way forward based on secular, human, scientific ways of thinking and acting and want to leave the supernatural out of it as much as they possibly can. And, and part of that is because perhaps they've been exposed to supernatural reality in a way that was just kind of, you know, went off the rails for them and they just can't conceive of it in any other, in any other kind of way that that's kind of the, maybe the difference between those, but here's my conviction. My conviction is that spirituality is universally relevant and significant for individual and collective well-being. I don't care if you're atheist, agnostic, pantheist, nothing at all. You're a known, which means you click that box that says none of the above. If you call yourself spiritual but not religious, whatever it is, I think spirituality, when properly understood, and I hate to say that because it sounds like, you know, there's it is universally relevant to every human being and I believe is the key for individual and collective well-being. Mm. I, I mean, I'm with you. I'd probably go in the panentheist camp. You know, I'd probably be like, everything's alive and then sold. You're, you're touching on something really interesting, going way back to the beginning on agency and codependence, and that there's something in the, what, you know, the woo, which is uh, that there's some force outside of you that's controlling your life and watching you all the time, the sort of Santa Claus divinity, versus the reality of quantum that there is a lot of mysterious, undocumented stuff on the space between us, the energy fields we are in, that is, you know, the people are just now trying to figure out. And that for me, this invisible field that is connecting everyone as if it was an invisible water, an ocean, that there is something alive in that. And that's the space that love inhabits for me, for me. And that it's, it's like that's woo also in its own way, but it's like woo based in frequency and energy and science and <laughs> quantum biology and microbiome. And, you know, there's there's a lot there without me having to give up the unique embodiment of my humanhood, of my personage. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. And I, I, I'm totally with you. I think sometimes language gets in the way. Sometimes I feel like the, everyone is there you know, is kind of pointing to a similar thing and using different language and different concepts to get to it. One of the ways I think is an archetypal figure that Jesus kind of relates is what you're just saying is it was an embodied divine essence or ground of being or ultimate reality. You know, like it wasn't that Jesus said, I'm divine and sort of human. It was, he was both at the same time without contradiction. Okay. Oh, we go on forever. I love this so much. I, I want to say you you your writing is so inspiring. It is so grounded in don't be afraid, trust life, trust your body, and, and really pointing out the places where the system, the industry of religion gets in the way of that. And it's it's not in an un you don't do it in an attacking way. You just speak it plainly. You don't go out after anybody in particular. No, no attack. Just this is what I see. 
And I find it really refreshing. And I hope more people who are on the edge of finding that freedom and retaining that spirituality can find your work and find more of you. Yes, I appreciate that. And one of the reasons I so appreciate you is that I honestly cannot name many people who create a space to really plummet into a wide spectrum of conversations relating to spirituality, the lived human experience. Like I look through the conversations that you've had and like you're like the breath and your capacity to engage such a wide spectrum of areas and to really do it well and to really dig into them and kind of mine that out for other people. It's just like, it's gold. Oh, thank you. I, I mean, it's my favorite thing I do. I have a lot of things I do because I've got the kids and the books and the company and all that stuff, but this is it. Like, I think these conversations on love and liberation, like how are you free in a body and how do you do it in a way that doesn't have that antagonism towards other people and toward life itself is like, that's that's what I'm most interested in. So we're we're like, you know, mutual appreciation society. Yeah, thank you very much. Well, wherever you're at in your journey to freedom, love, liberation, whatever messages you may have received that you are anything less than the perfect light of creation inhabiting your beautiful body from the moment you were born until right now. I apologize on behalf of the culture because we want people who feel beautiful and great and excited about their embodiment and their life. I want to tell you in advance that we are having a festival at the farm in January. It's the 25th, the 28th. I'm just hosting it, but the producer is John Decott uh, from Bless Fest. We're very lucky to have Mom Muse, Paul Isaac, uh, Jaya Lakshmi. So if you're at all into this kind of general upliftment for many traditions, Please join us for yoga and music and all of that stuff on the Big Island of Hawaii in January, blessfest.org. And I would love to hear from you, the.rose.woman on Instagram. My own site is christinemariemason.com, rosebudwoman, rosewoman.com, the company I started that makes incredible intimate care products, or Radiant Farms, uh, good gummies, good gracious gummies. If you go to radiantfarms.us, you can learn a lot about microdosing, microdosing with copy, uh, kava for pain and inflammation, kana gummies for heart opening, just a ton of information on how to listen to the plants, how to work with the plants to feel better. Part of what we're doing at Rosebud and part of what we're doing at Radiant Farms is to restore our right relationship to the natural world, which is another perversion of some Western spiritualities that devalue the creation Uh, We've done a lot on eco-spirituality in prior episodes, so feel free to head back and revisit some of those if you've missed them. May you walk through the world today with that lens of love. I just want to ask you if you've ever lain out under the stars and considered your place in the universe. Who are you? How do you fit into the fabric of time? How do you fit into the generations that have come before you and the ones that will be coming after? And how are you connected to every other person across time space who has ever had these thoughts? It's questions like these that cause a person to fall in love with Walt Whitman, who in the 1800s was writing poems like this one, On the Beach Alone at Night. On the Beach at Night Alone, As the old mother sways her to and fro, singing her husky song, as I watch the bright star shining, I think a thought of the clef of the universe's end of the future. A vast similitude interlocks all, all spheres grown, ungrown, small and large, suns, moons, planets, all distances of place, however wide. All distances of time, all inanimate forms, all souls, all living bodies, though they be ever so different, or in different worlds, all gaseous, watery, vegetable, mineral, processes, the fishes, the brutes, 
All nations, colors, barbarisms, civilizations, languages, all identities that have existed or may exist on this globe or any globe, all lives and deaths, all of the past, present, and future. This vast similitude spans them and always has spanned and shall forever span them and compactly hold and enclose them. That's on the beach alone at night. Deep Thoughts with Walt Whitman. Uh, we, we did a reading a few years ago um, in San Francisco of Crossing Brooklyn Ferry, which is one of Whitman's pieces. And it's also a testimony to our interlaced lives across space and time. You know, he was like an early quantum it's like he's on an acid trip all the time, you know, even way back then. Uh, so I'm going to read this one also. I, I just love it so much. All right, Crossing Brooklyn Ferry. Flood tide below me. I see you face to face. Clouds of the west. Sun there, half an hour high. I see you also face to face. Crowds of men and women attired in the usual costumes. How curious you are to me on the ferry boats, the hundreds and hundreds that cross returning home are more curious to me than you suppose. And you that shall cross from shore to shore years hence are more to me and more in my meditations than you might suppose. The impalpable sustenance of me from all things at all hours of the day, the simple, compact, well-jointed scheme myself disintegrated Everyone disintegrated, yet part of the scheme, the similitudes of the past and those of the future. Others will enter the gates of the ferry and cross from shore to shore. Others will watch the run of the flood tide. Others will see the shipping of Manhattan north and west and the heights of Brooklyn to the south and east. And others will see the islands, large and small. Fifty years hence, others will see them as they cross the sun half an hour high, a hundred years hence, or ever so many hundred years hence, others will see them, will enjoy the sunset, the pouring in of the flood tide, the falling back to the sea of the ebb tide. It avails not time nor space, distance avails not. I am with you, you men and women of a generation, or ever so many generations hence, just as you feel when you look on the river and sky, so I felt just as any of you is one of a living crowd, I was one of a crowd. Just as you are refreshed by the gladness of the river and the bright flow, I was refreshed. And just as you stand and lean on the rail, yet hurry with the swift current, I stood, yet was hurried. So what is it then between us? What is the count of the scores or hundreds of years between us? Whatever it is, it avails not. Distance avails not, and place avails not. I too lived. Brooklyn of ample hills was mine. I too walked the streets of Manhattan Island and bathed in the waters around it. I too felt the curious abrupt questionings stir within me. It is not upon you alone the dark patches fall. The dark threw its patches down upon me also. The best I had done seemed to me blank and suspicious. My great thoughts, as I supposed them, were they not in reality meager? Nor is it you alone who know what it is to be evil. I am he who knew what it was to be evil. I too knitted the old knot of contrariety, blabbed, blushed, resented, lied, stole, grudged, had guile, anger, lust, hot wishes I dared not speak, was wayward and vain and greedy and shallow and sly, cowardly, malignant. I was the wolf, the snake, the hog, not wanting in me, the cheating look, the frivolous word, the adulterous wish, not wanting, refusals, hates, postponements, meanness, laziness, none of these wanting, was one with the rest, the days and haps of the rest, was called by my nighest name, by clear, loud voices of young men, as they saw me approaching or passing, and felt their arms on my neck as I stood, or the negligent leaning of their flesh against me as I sat, saw many I loved in the street or ferry boat or public assembly, yet never told them a word, lived the same life with the rest, the same old laughing, gnawing, sleeping, played the part that still looks back on the actor or actress, the same old role, 
the role that is what we make it, as great as we like, or as small as we like, or both great and small. I mean, come on! He is speaking to us across hundreds of years of time space and just saying it's it's all one. We are not separate. We are continuations of the process of life itself. So hopefully, Whitman, in the depth and incredible intensity of his feeling and what he was writing about, I mean, just go read his body of work, the tremendous detail of his noticing outside of himself and the detail of his noticing inside of himself. He feels so much, no lacking of feeling to inform his life and his choices. He knows who he is outside of dogma and structure and institution. He knows that he is part of the time-space continuum of the endless fabric of life. <laughs>